Awesome. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dr. Gleave. So yeah, as uh, Dr. Gleave said, I'm um, my name's Kate, uh, and I'm over in Bristol uh, in the UK doing a fellowship in functional urology. So I'm going to be speaking about several different functional urology topics today. I'm, I'm just going to... Okay, Thank you. Just a reminder to everybody to please mute their mics. Uh, great, thanks. So uh, this is kind of the outline of uh, what we'll go through today. So just a brief introduction to me, and obviously uh, Dr. Gleave uh, has given you a bit of my background. Then we're going to talk just briefly about my fellowship experience, and I'll kind of come back to that throughout the talk as the rest of the talk is structured around three of my um, clinical interests and uh, three uh, research projects on those topics. And I'll try to compare and contrast as we go uh, about the Canadian experience, as obviously I'm Canadian trained, uh, and what I've been um, seeing and some practice differences uh, over here in the UK. And then there should be time at the end, about uh, 15 minutes or so for questions and discussion. So hopefully you all had the opportunity to read through the objectives uh, that were sent around uh, last week. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, a, new, a novel type of indwelling urinary catheter that we're trialing here um, and talk about sacral neuromodulation in the treatment of overactive bladder, in particular nocturia. Uh, then we're going to talk uh, about both uh, female stress incontinence surgeries and potential complications and then <clears throat> how those um, how we uh, treat patients with a female SUI in the UK versus um, in Canada and kind of some forward directions with that as well. Uh, so as Dr. Gleave uh, alluded to, I'm from Halifax originally, and I did both my medical school and my uh, urology residency there. And then I flew across the pond to Bristol and I've got two pictures here of Bristol. So this one on the far left is actually in Dalhousie. You can see the Atlantic Ocean. Um, different than the Pacific, but uh, you can see that from our Dal Dalhousie building. And then it, over here is Bristol. So this is Bristol University. And this building was built about 150 years prior to this one, which is our South Mead Hospital, where we do most of our uh, reconstructive work. Um, and there's a lot of beautiful, I could spend an entire talk showing you beautiful buildings uh, in and around Bristol and London and the UK, but uh, that's for a different time. Uh, so if you are like me, you may not know, or you may not know yet a lot about Bristol. And that was definitely the case for me before uh, looking into the fellowship. Um, so ho hopefully I've put a, a map here. So we've got Bristol down in the southwest corner of England. It's very close to Wales and um, about an hour and a half from London. It's quite well known for uh, its maritime history and uh, shipping and things like that. Uh, but if you're not into um, shipping and boats. Uh, you may have heard of Banksy. Uh, he's actually from Bristol. He's a, a really famous street artist or graffiti artist. And this is a picture I took downtown of one of his more famous uh, works. And um, if you don't know about Banksy, you may at least know about the Bristol stool chart, uh, which is a really lovely way of classifying uh, bowel movements. Um, but the other thing that Bristol is quite known for is actually their functional urology department and urodynamics in particular. Um, they're quite, we are quite world renowned uh, for, for that, uh, running um, international urodynamics courses. And this uh, book, um, this textbook is kind of like the Bible of urodynamics. And it's written by, uh, originally by Paul Abrams, who um, was the, the head consultant here in Functional uh, up until just a couple of years ago. He does still come in um, every few Fridays to have tea with us in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, you may note here it's edited by uh, these three characters, um, two of which are featured here. So these are the three functional urology uh, consultants at Bristol. Um, Professor Hashim Hashim is my uh, clinical fellowship director. And then Professor Drake um, has moved his clinical work just last month. Um, he actually moved to London, but he's still working with us for research. And then in the middle is Miss Ochao. Um, and I would like you to know that in England, if you're a surgeon, you actually are no longer called doctor, you're Miss or Mr. And it is actually uh, apparently quite offensive if you accidentally call someone Dr. Ochao and not Miss Ochao. Um, just so you all know, I learned that the hard way. 
There are a lot of different topics in female functional neurourology reconstruction. So on this slide here, it kind of goes through what that means at Bristol, uh, because it means something a little bit different, I think, everywhere. Um, we do a lot of urodynamics, obviously, that's um, what they're best known for. Uh, we also run quite a few interesting clinics. Uh, many of them are multidisciplinary uh, focus um, with neurology, for example, or with our specialist nurse providers. Um, we do a variety of stress incontinence surgeries for men and women, uh, reconstruction, including uh, fistula repairs, and we're the main um, reconstruction center for the southwest of England, and um, cystectomies, cystoplasties. My sub-interest surgery uh, is urethroplasty, so I do that every uh, week or, or so, and everyone can choose a bit of a different sub-interest. And then, of course, um, our research um, here is, is quite robust, so we'll talk uh, quite a lot about that. So there are several um, multi-center trials that are going on with um, the PI or um, uh, head investigator here at Bristol. So this is how the rest of the talk is going to be structured. Uh, so th three different clinical interest areas of mine, and obviously um, I love functional urology and could talk about all sorts of things, but for the interest of time, we're going to do just three. Um, so neurogenic bladder uh, management or refractory OAB, and then female stress incontinence. So let's jump right in with neurogenic bladder. Um, so as we all know in urology, uh, neurogenic bladder can be quite debilitating um, and many patients uh, manage their um, bladder by some sort of a assisted technology. So maybe that is intermittent self-catheterizing, perhaps we do a cystoplasty and a metrophenoff, um, but many patients actually uh, the best option for them and, and what works best for them is some form of a long-term indwelling catheter. Um, of course, other patients that don't have neurogenic bladder may also require a long-term indwelling catheter, and it's, it's quite, quite common. Um, and of course, it's really common for us on, in urology to get called about problems with indwelling catheters as well. Um, what you may not know is that the kind of Foley catheter that we're most familiar with now was actually invented in 1935 uh, by this um, handsome chap over here, uh, Dr. Frederick Foley. He was in Minnesota. And uh, this was the first type of rubberized catheter, which um, inflated via balloon and, and therefore retained itself in that manner. There was other catheters like the Malacot, uh, which would be sutured on to the penis or to the labia, for example. But this was a huge revolution uh, to have uh, a balloon uh, and the catheter could stay in. And you can see in the picture maybe that he's got, uh, this is back in probably 1935 or 40, um, with a uh, catheter that looks very much like um, like this one here, which um, is one here in the department. So quite recent. So not a lot has changed. And I have nothing against the Foley catheter. I mean, I love it as much as every urologist should love a Foley catheter, but we know there are a lot of problems. So catheter associated urinary tract infection is the most common uh, nosocomial infection. Um, it, about 10 to 50% of nosocomial infections uh, are believed to be uh, catheter associated UTIs. That of course can lead to hospitalization, urosepsis, even death. Um, because of the design of the Foley, the uh, eyes are up at the top, of course, and um, that can lead to the them getting sucked into the water wall, even causing trauma to the water wall, getting blocked. Um, the urine can pool uh, beneath where the eye hole uh, is. That's called the sump effect, leading to stagnant urine, uh, potentially increasing the risk of infection and urine bypassing and skin breakdown. So a lot of um, issues uh, with an otherwise excellent um, invention. So our question was at Bristol, could, could we invent something or improve upon 1930s technology? And, and we felt that uh, we could. Um, so that is where the flume catheter comes in. So um, this uh, has several design uh, improvements or changes. Um, you can see it looks uh, different right off, off the top. So it's an asymmetrical um, or non-spherical and asymmetrical balloon shape. Um, so that the eye hole is actually protected within the balloon. Um, and so that should reduce, therefore, that sump effect I was mentioning, where the urine pools at the base. So it all drains out. Um, and because there's no pointy kind of stabby bit, um, that 
you can't poke or stab through the bladder as easily. So hopefully less uh, risk of bladder trauma, hopefully less risk of pain. Um, and um, most importantly, in, especially for our neurogenic patients, uh, hopefully to reduce uh, catheter associated UTI risk. Um, so of course there was some preclinical data done here and uh, we looked firstly in vitro using a glass bladder model, um, which is a validated uh, model. And we inoculated the um, urine, uh, the fluid with Proteus mirabellus to kind of simulate um, biofilm formation and also uh, potentially um, catheter colonization. And uh, the flume catheter time to blockage was 16 to 60 percent longer than in the Foley type controls. And we used two different types of um, standard Foley catheters on the market. And then we moved on to an animal model uh, using a, um, a uh, perfused pig bladder isolated perfuse pig bladder. And, um, <clears throat> and the provider that was placing the catheter into the pig bladder um, found that the catheter was easy to place, the balloon stayed inflated, uh, retained in there, deflated easily, easy to remove. And as we expected, the balloon helped to shield the eye holes and um, there was a low propensity seen to acute blockage. Um, so then it was time uh, for humans. Um, and so I'm actually the principal investigator for this trial. Um, and it is the first in humans um, testing of the flume catheter. So our primary objective was to, to determine the catheter function, ease of placement, removal, et cetera. Um, our secondary objectives were to identify if there are any problems with the flume design. Um, of course, calculate our adverse event rates um, and identify if there was any specific training needs that a provider would need uh, who already knows how to place a standard Foley catheter. Um, so um, our stage one um, design was for patients who were undergoing a routine uh, planned uh, cystoscopy under general anesthetic. Um, so that would be um, most commonly a ureteroscopy. So something where they were going to have a scope put in through the urethra and under general, and then uh, they wouldn't normally have a catheter at the end of the case. So um, ureteroscopy was the one that was most of those cases. Um, so the catheter was inserted under GA, it had to stay in for two minutes, and then it was removed under GA. So it only extended the time for the procedure by two minutes. Um, the inclusion criteria for all of stage one and two uh, are over here on the right-hand side. So we had any adult uh, patient of any gender who was able to give informed consent, and then they had to either be having a procedure as per stage one, uh, or be a long-term catheter user as per stage two. So um, moving to stage one B, um, this was where a patient was having a catheter placed under general anesthetic as part of their routine operation. Um, so uh, the most common thing that we, um, or most common surgery was a radical nephrectomy or a partial nephrectomy um, because um, the patient would normally have a catheter placed and then they would wake up with a catheter in all routine. And then the catheter was planned to be removed within 72 hours of being awake. So uh, we didn't extend their operative time by any amount because the catheter was normally going to be placed there. Um, for our exclusion criteria, I'll just put them here and not read through all of them, but um, Hopefully you can have a, a read through and, and if you think any of them aren't reasonable, um, please let me know at the end. Um, so we actually just finished at the end of August stage 1A and 1B, which is um, really exciting because it was um, a lot of work to push, push it through. Um, and just uh, on September 30th, um, we got approval to move through to stage two. So stage two is any long-term catheter user um, who normally has had a Foley catheter for at least three months leading up to this time, and then also um, plan to have a long-term catheter ongoing for at least three more months. And so the uh, plan is we're going to be placing the uh, flume catheter uh, in their home setting, but with the district nurses, and um, the catheter will stay in uh, for a month, and then they'll be switched back to a regular Foley catheter, whatever one they used to have. Um, yeah, so we just got the, the thumbs up to start accrual and actually have a meeting uh, tomorrow with the whole team uh, where we're going to make uh, plans to get this going. Exciting. So um, moving on to refractory overactive bladder, the second of the clinical interests we'll be going through today and research. So refractory overactive bladder. 
uh, super common. Uh, some estimates are up to 40% of people uh, have issues with overactive bladder. And then a percentage of those will have refractory overactive bladder, as in um, they're um, not improving with all of our first line and second line options. So as per the CUA guidelines, and I saw Dr. Stethers was, is here in the audience today. She's an author on that. So uh, hopefully I'm paraphrasing this correctly. Um, behavioral, lifestyle, patient education, and then uh, medications. And here at Bristol, our, our medications that we would use would be anticholinergic and then a beta 3 agonist, um, and then actually combination therapy, unless they have a contraindication to being on one or the other of the types. So if they fail all that, uh, then we need to move along to third line options. And as per the CUA guidelines, our third line options include uh, PTNS, uh, bladder, Botox in injections, and sacral neuromodulation. I grade out PTNS uh, mainly just because we don't do it here at Bristol, um, although there has been talk about uh, potentially starting a trial here uh, comparing PTNS and SNM here. Um, but I'm going to talk now about sacral neuromodulation. So every talk I go to uh, on sacral neuromodulation, every talk I give on sacral neuromodulation, uh, everyone always says, oh, you have to talk about how it works. And the, the problem is, is that it's not totally understood, but there are some really reasonable theories and it seems to be holding up in terms of um, uh, kind of basic science research as well. So this is not just completely um, off the top of my head. These are, these are established. Uh, so uh, one theory is that there is um, indirect stimulation of efferent fibers that go to the striated urethral sphincter, um, which then leads to the um, detrusor to relax because it tells this the urethral sphincter, okay, now it's time, everything's fine, relax the detrusor, and that therefore should promote storage. And second um, uh, theory is that the afferent fibers are stimulated, which then leads to an inhibition at both the spinal and supraspinal levels um, of the reflex uh, to cause the bladder to contract. However, it works is probably a combination of, of both um, things because we have seen uh, in many trials that it's effective for both uh, some for some people in both storage conditions and emptying uh, problems. So for um, non-obstructive uh, urinary retention and also for overactive bladder. Um, these are the indications um, as per the uh, International Continent Society 2018 um, best practice statement, but then I've tried to link it as well with CUA. Um, so uh, the top one in green, refractory overactive bladder, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so it's, it's listed there uh, clearly as a third line option uh, with grade B evidence. Um, for uh, IC or in interstitial cystitis bladder pain syndrome, it is also in that guideline uh, as per the CUA, but it's kind of listed as just an option. It's not a, you know, first, second, third line or anything. It's just an option. And then grade C. Um, for um, neurogenic lower urinary tract um, uh, di disorder, which actually um, Dr. Kavanaugh, I think was the uh, was an officer on, on that guideline. Um, it's listed there as an option. And this is for kind of well um, selected patients, for example, someone with stable MS. And then it's also an option for non-obstructive urinary retention or um, non-neurogenic voiding dysfunction. Okay, so let's do refractory overactive bladder and sacral neuromodulation. Um, at uh, Bristol, how we are the BUI at Bristol, what we do is um, every patient has to have your dynamically confirmed detrusor overactivity. And that has mainly to do with how we obtain the funding uh, for the patient since it's NHS or public health care system like in Canada. Um, so once they have confirmed DO, uh, then they all have to complete um, baseline three-day voiding diary, uh, the ICIQ LUTs and ICIQ quality of life surveys. Um, and then from there, we do a fluoroscopy guided uh, stage one um, SNM or, or peripheral nerve evaluation. Um, it's under local anesthetic. So, um, so we don't usually do a timed first stage, which is another um, way of doing things. Uh, so we do this under local anesthetic with the uh, PNE um, needle and lead. And you can see at the top of the page there, that's um, an example of uh, placing the needle through the S3 foramina. Um, we then uh, do a two-week trial phase, and uh, during that time, the patient fills out uh, those same bladder diary 
boarding diary uh, and the same surveys. And then they meet with um, with us again and we calculate out from the bladder diary and also from their score from their surveys if they've had at least a 50% improvement. And if they have, and if they want to, uh, then we talk with them about proceeding to a full implant. Um, and we give them options of either Medtronic or the Axonics, which are two major um, brands, and then either rechargeable or non-rechargeable. And we do the full implant in the um, operating room under sedation, um, very rarely under GA. Uh, okay, um, so one of the symptoms of overactive bladder is nocturia, but I think it would be wrong for me to just say nocturia and then move on because um, we know that nocturia is often quite uh, multifactorial. And in fact, this really nice um, kind of schematic infographic is from the PLANET trial, which um, the first and uh, senior authors are both from Bristol. So Matt Smith from BU, uh, from Bristol University, and then Marcus Drake, as mentioned previously. And they did some nice work looking at um of causes aside from the bladder um, for, or, or aside from urologic for nocturia. So it is important, of course, to consider that there's many, many things, but I think a lot of patients feel like this, that their bladder is in charge and their bladder is telling them when to wake up. And certainly um, anecdotally, we are hearing that a lot from patients uh, we are counseling regarding the options for um, uh, third line options for overactive bladder. And they are saying, I'm really bothered by nocturia though is it going to help my nocturia and then when we looked at the literature there really wasn't a lot about that so um, that's where we came up with this research um, idea um, so as I mentioned uh, the effect on nocturia specifically is um, not well studied um, so what we did is a retrospective chart review um, of our patients here over the last five years who've had an SNM implanted uh, for either refractory overactive bladder or if they had voiding dysfunction, but also to trace their overactivity on their urodynamic studies. Um, the patients, as I mentioned previously, all had these bladder diaries and all the surveys done. And then we gleaned some long-term information from repeat bladder diaries, surveys, and clinic letters. Uh, so over the five-year time period, we had 111 patients implanted here uh, for that indication. Um, and we had full comparative measures for 108 uh, of the patients. And um, we found that during the PNE phase, so that, that two week trial phase, there was a statistically significant decrease in the reduction of their median nocturia. So from around three to about one and a half times per night. Um, and uh, I would say also to note that 83% of our patients were female. So this is a female heavy uh, cohort. Um, <clears throat> the patients overall, uh, so this is at their long-term follow-up and the median long-term follow-up was about two years or 25 months. 62% um, of the patients had at least a 50% improvement, which was um, which continued to be the case um, in the long-term. No patients actually had worsened nocturia after SNM placement. So um, of the ones who had improvement, 85% of them sustained that improvement. Um, so obviously that's um, that's a really positive and excellent finding, but it is a small study. Um, we are going, actually my junior on the paper is, is going to... Um, look at the bladder diaries and calculate out their baseline nocturnal polyuria index and then see and do a correlation to see if perhaps there's, um, if they have nocturnal polyuria, are they more or less likely or no difference um, of having an improvement? And that'll help our counseling as well. And then of course, we need prospective data uh, for this and for those patients who don't have nutritional activity as well. Um, okay, we're just breezing through this. So for the third topic, um, it's a little bit longer than the other ones because we have to talk about stress urinary incontinence and then also um, complications from surgery for stress incontinence. Um, <clears throat> so uh, female stress incontinence is also super, super common condition. Um, uh, uh, the guesstimate is about one in seven women undergo SUI surgery at some point. Um, as for the CUA guidelines, and, and I wanted to mention it is from 2012 and they're, they're updating it now. Um, but the the mainstay, uh, first line things are treatment options uh, that include lifestyle changes, um, smoking cessation, um, pelvic floor physiotherapy, uh, vaginal pessary as an option as well. And then mainly the, the big kind of things are surgical options. 
Um, so of course we have urethral bulking agents, uh, various type of mid urethral slings, mini slings, and single incision slings, all synthetic materials. Uh, then autologous fascial sling, otherwise known as a pupil vaginal sling, uh, copal suspension, a female AUS. Um, and I just uh, took a little screenshot from the 2012 guidelines to show you these um, kind of uh, options that they had there. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk about mid urethral slings uh, and mesh. So um, transvaginal mesh, uh, both for stress incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse, um, was introduced uh, in the early 2000s, or it began to be kind of mainstay in the early 2000s. And I like to think about uh, when I'm talking about mesh problems. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of timelines for mesh. So the good was definitely the early 2000s. And the good was there because uh, mesh was awesome. It had short operative time, uh, low length of stay in hospital, often like one night or even less, uh, fast recovery time for patients. So that you could say that then you're, you're going to be back to what you want to be doing uh, in a couple of weeks um, and really and really good results. Um, other things that were good in the early 2000s uh, was the gene on gene look uh, that um, uh, this uh, famous couple was sporting. Um, sadly, they broke up and that was late later in the 2000s, similarly, that's when mesh started to have a problem. So I don't know if that's connected, but probably is. Um, in the around 2010, um, that's when patient safety groups kind of started to speak out and they said, there's there's complications and no one's really talking about them. Um, so then uh, various uh, big societies started to put out um, uh, warnings and recommendations, uh, CUA, of course, AUA, EAU. Um, and uh, they would talk about things like the consent process, the importance of offering alternative procedures, uh, setting up national audits for complications and also implant, implant uh, implantation rates um, and recognizing complications do exist. And then it got pretty ugly. So um, 2018 um, in actually Canada, the US and the UK, um, both uh, pelvic organ prolapse mesh and stress urinary incontinence mesh uh, were banned. In the UK, they call that paused. Uh, that's just because they're really proper and polite, but it, it's straight up banned. Um, you can't, you can't put, um, pelvic organ prolapse mesh or stress incontinence mesh in, uh, at all in the UK and you, and you still can't. So, um, it's not done. Uh, whereas in Canada and the US, what happened was there was this uh, original kind of like outcry thing that happened. Um, but then, um, with a kind of, reviewing of the literature and the complication rates, um, both the, the CUA, AUA and SUFU came out with a um, joint statement. And they said, you know, the problems are really mainly with transvaginal uh, pop mesh. And so actually uh, stress incontinence mesh should be allowed and, and is uh, allowed as uh, we all know. Um, transvaginal pop mesh though continues to be restricted use um, both in Canada and the US. In 2019, uh, in the UK at the beginning of 2019 was when these meshectomy centers started to pop up. And um, these meshectomy centers are established all over the UK. This map shows uh, all of them. And this is, uh, I think, current uh, from 2021. Um, <clears throat> you can see here Bristol down in the blue. So we cover everything uh, blue because that's all the southwest of Ingr England. So we have uh, quite a large catchment area. There are several centers in London as well, just they have obviously a more dense population there. Um, so uh, the complications that were the issue are, are usually actually not the intraoperative complications, although of course that is important. So that's that dreaded, uh, you know, you place the, the trocar and then you look in on your cystoscopy and the trocar's metal is sitting in the bladder and you have to apologize to Dr. Kavanaugh because you um, just stabbed the bladder um, and then you have to do it again. Um, properly. <laughs> um, so that's one of the issues. Um, but the, the the other things that a lot of the patient safety groups are talking about are things like void dysfunction, um, mesh exposure in the vagina, causing pain. Um, uh, his peronia is when actually the male partner uh, is um, injured or having pain because of intercourse, because of exposed mesh, um, possible issues with sending effect, infection, pain, discharge, and then mesh, mesh extrusions, right, into the urinary tract. Um, that can lead to recurrent UTIs, blood in the urine, voiding dysfunction, voiding difficulties, etc. <clears throat> um, 
So I wanted to throw a big old caveat sticker onto this slide because it, I know it probably feels like really dark and stormy and I've brought over the, I don't know, the Atlantic hurricane season to the to UBC right now um, about mesh. And it's not, I don't personally feel that um, mesh is like, should be banned for everyone. I think that in a well-selected patient by the right provider, um, certainly a very reasonable option, if not a very, very good option. Um, and that's not just my opinion. I think that can be backed up um, with some evidence. It's just not um, an opinion I often share here in the UK because of the current uh, kind of political climate with MESH, but, um, but I will share it with you all. Um, so this was a paper um, which kind of backs up what I feel and what many people, um, uh, many providers feel. So um, serious mesh complications are things that we want to watch out for. And this paper is from Blaine Welk uh, from Western um, Ontario um, and colleagues. And he they did a retrospective cohort study looking at women over a 10-year period in Ontario who had um, SUI mesh placed. They had almost 60,000 patients. Um, so over their main findings, um, to sum it up, is that over a 10-year period, one in, 30, one in 30 women required um, kind of a major um, uh, change, so a, a revision or removal of the mesh. So that'd be kind of like a Clavian Dindo 4, if you want to classify it in terms of seriousness of complications. Um, they did also find that low-volume centers uh, had a 37% higher likelihood of serious complications. And overall, this uh, very large, uh, well-done paper or uh, paper published in JAMA surgery um, supports the use of stress urinary incontinence mesh in the well counseled patient by a skilled provider. Um, okay, so but back to the UK, this is what they found. Um, and it's and it's it's strikingly different. So I think because they had strikingly different findings, it's very reasonable that they have strikingly different um, uh, kind of guidelines. So uh, this was a, a paper done here um, in England uh, specifically. So um, they looked at an eight year period um, and it was 92,000 women who had SUI, um, actually a, a SUI mesh placed. Um, and 9.8% of patients undergoing surgical mesh insertion experienced some kind of periprocedural complication. Um, and now they did not do it the way that Blaine Welk's study did, where they looked at only revision removal. This was any complication, um, which all of these um, complications now are audited here in the UK. So anytime you put mesh in, uh, not that we do it anymore, but anytime we were remove it. Um, we have to fill out this thing called the yellow card and there's a whole audit system um, <clears throat> about mesh. So um, so obviously their findings was quite a quite a higher uh, complication rate, uh, hence uh, the concern. Um, there are uh, risk factors that make someone more likely to have a mesh related co mesh complication and that's either mesh related, um, patient related or surgery related. I think the mesh related risk factors are really interesting um, because they're kind of, they get down to the, like the science of foreign bodies uh, in, in, in people. Um, and uh, anytime you implant any kind of foreign body, there is going to be some degree of, uh, of reaction. Uh, and that will depend a lot upon the type of the foreign body, the structure and the volume of the material or the bulk of the material. Um, when you implant something and for this, we'll say mesh. So when you plant mesh for stress incontinence, a biofilm does begin to form. Um, and that uh, creates an inflammatory response um, most characterized by macrophages. The macrophages can then be talked about in two uh, phenotypes, M1 and M2. M1 is the pro-inflammatory um, type, uh, and that leads to uh, cytokine um, and chemokines, which um, brings about degradative uh, enzymes uh, and chronic inflammation. And what's happening is, is that the macrophages are essentially trying to degrade this foreign body, but they can't degrade it. So then what can happen is tissue breakdown around that area and potentially even mesh exposure. Um, the M2 uh, or uh, phenotype uh, is really for remodeling, which sounds good because it's mainly growth factors, um, recruiting fibroblasts, um, secreting collagen, which actually does help to anchor the mesh to some degree, but sometimes they get a little bit um, overzealous and that uh, fibrosis increases to the point that it actually can contract upon the mesh, pull on surrounding tissues, leading to um, significant adhesions, pain, um, and other complications. 
Um, in terms of biocompatibility, um, the mesh uh, biocompatibility really depends upon three main factors. Um, so the porosity, uh, as in the number and size, um, and I like to say bigger is better in terms of uh, pores, um, because it allows the immune cells to infiltrate better uh, through uh, the mesh if, uh, if there is any infection. Um, for the fiber type, uh, sol solo is safer. Obviously, I made these up. Um, so solo is safer because um, multifilament um, creates uh, more area for bacteria to colonize and can therefore lead to increased infection rates. Um, the bulk of the mesh, um, low weight, less reaction, Obviously, I'm not a poet. Um, so the bulk of the mesh, you want it to have a low weight. So really, the ideal implant is a large pore, low weight monofilament uh, mesh. There are patient-related and surgery and surgeon-related factors as well. So smoking actually increases the rate of mesh exposure in women uh, up to five times. Uh, they, we think the, the likely reason for that is um, potentially microvascular disease leading to less uh, robust wound healing, but maybe also something to do with chronic cough and increased pressure in the area. General urinary syndrome of menopause or vaginal atrophy, um, the tissue in the vagina and um, the, uh, the urinary tract in women, especially distally, is uh, estrogen responsive. Um, and so with less estrogen there, it's, it's like the, the tissue is not as strong. Um, and that can lead to increased rate of um, exposure. Increased age and obesity are also risk factors. And then um, there's been some studies, and Blaine Welk's study was one of them, where they found that if um, this, the uh, center had a lower volume of um, doing incontinence procedures, they had a higher rate of complications. Um, however, there's no actual definition of what a high volume center constitutes, although from the NICE guidelines in England, um, they say over 20 cases per year, but it's not based on very sound evidence. Uh, here in Bristol, we are a meshectomy center. And so what that means is that we have a, a whole system set up with um, specialist nurse providers. Um, we have a mesh multidisciplinary team meeting every, uh, I think it's every third week now, um, where we have three or four hours with um, us in the urology, functional urology, uh, urogynecologists. Uh, we have specialist nurse, nurse mesh providers practitioners, um, radiologist uh, dedicated to uh, reviewing any imaging um, for potential mesh complications, including MRI, um, and a psychologist. And then sometimes we also involve orthopedics and sometimes colorectal surgery, um, depending upon where the complication is. These are the options that we give um, all patients. So watchful waiting and conservative therapies. Um, if the mesh exposure is very small in the vagina um, and the person has gender urinary syndrome of menopause, we may recommend um, trialing um, vaginal estrogen uh, for a couple of months, uh, for example. Um, <clears throat> endoscopic removal, um, that's uh, specifically uh, for urinary tract extrusion. Um, so we can either do that via cystoscopy in a holmium YAG laser or transurethral resection with a bipolar loop. Um, we also offer partial mesh removal and trimming of exposed mesh plus minus reconstruction with coverage. Um, I would say that partial mesh removal makes a later total mesh removal if someone wants that uh, way more difficult because uh, oftentimes the, if you take just like, for example, the mesh in the vagina out, um, then the arms on either side, let's say for a TBT retropubic, um, kind of retract up and then it's really hard to find. We, we do find them, but, but it is hard. Um, and then the total mesh removal um, can, it, it means of course, removing everything, uh, all the arms of the mesh, um, vaginal and any erosion anywhere else, um, and then possibly reconstructing the bladder, the urethra, the vagina, sometimes the bowel, and we would involve colorectal for that. So we're gonna talk about some work I'm doing on endoscopic or cystoscopic mesh removal. 
Um, so we offer it to patients, uh, and there is, uh, but there isn't really robust evidence to say uh, what the long-term outcomes are. So what we did is um, looked at a, a retro retrospective chart review and also um, administered a barrage of follow-up surveys for patients um, at our center. So um, this was any patient who had uh, mesh removed uh, cystoscopically um, between um, April 2020 or 2013 to 2021. Uh, we gave them uh, all of these uh, patient reported outcome measures for the follow-up surveys. And um, that is because there is currently no mesh specific, mesh complication specific validated questionnaire. Although it is something we're working on here in Bristol ourselves, along with some of the other meshectomy centers. Um, so for our results, uh, we had 27 women who had who chose cystoscopic mesh removal, um, and overall 80% of them were quite satisfied with their surgery. Um, this was actually the largest series of cystoscopic mesh removal cases that had long-term follow-up patient reported outcome measures. So hopefully it adds to literature quite significantly. Uh, oh, in the top right corner there of this slide is... Um, an image I took of um, a mesh that had eroded. It was a TVT um, retropubic mesh that eroded into the urethra. And you can see there's some adherent calcification there. She was having pain, voiding troubles and um, hematuria. She was getting a hematuria workup actually. Um, and that's how she was discovered to have this problem. Um, Here's some more of our results. Um, we found that uh, if you look at the ICIQS, so that's the satisfaction questionnaire results, it has six questions. Um, the one I'm circling there is for patients who said that, so 100% of the patients who responded, which was 20 uh, for long-term follow-up, um, they said that they would choose this type of mesh removal again if um, if they had the problem again. Um, and 90%, just to the right of that, um, yeah, to the right of that there, um, the question uh, essentially reads, if your friend or family member was in a similar situation, would you recommend that this to them? And 90% said they would, and 10% said they were not sure. But no one said they, they, they wouldn't. <laughs> Um, so um, overall, our patients seem to be um, satisfied with the surgery. Um, the outcomes were good. The um, complication rate was really low. Um, it, and all of our complications from this type of surgery were only clavian dindo one. So things like a, a UTI, but no one was admitted to hospital or anything like that. Um, so I guess then that brings about the question, if, uh, if we're not going to do mesh, which again, just to go back to my caveat, I, I do think we should do mesh for some patients, but but people are asking, um, you know, moving forward, what what to do, and especially here in the UK where we're not doing any mesh at all, and we're doing only for um, mid urethral type procedures, we're doing autologous fascial slings. Obviously, that's at the bottleneck, but um, you know, that's a much more morbid surgery. So, what can what can we offer them um, with a similar efficacy rate? So, um, there's some work going on about absorbable synthetic polymers, which is really interesting. Also, biologic things such as acellular collagen. And I wanted to highlight um, a uh, abstract that uh, was presented at ICS, at International Continent Society in Vienna, um, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this is a group from Paris, and they are looking at using um, uh, umbilical cord lining um, from the umbilical vein. Um, and so what they did is they um, uh, consented uh, fe human female women um, who had just given birth to donate their umbilical cord. Uh, and then they uh, stripped the vein um, and then used the, the, that lining uh, to create essentially like a mid urethral sling for female rats who they had... Um, made uh, have intrinsic sphincter deficiency by um, cutting their bilateral penile nerves. Um, so they actually had really good outcomes with this. Of course, this is um, in rats, um, but uh, but still, I think it's really interesting and moving forward, something um, certainly I'm hoping to be uh, seeing more of uh, in human trials. So we're just getting to the end here. Um, so again, here were our objectives for the talk. So we talked uh, first about uh, the flume catheter, and hopefully um, uh, you all appreciated that the because the eye holes are below a non-spherical type balloon, um, we are seeing improved drainage, and we're hoping that we will also see uh, going forward in stage two, um, decreased catheter-associated UTI risk. 
our uh, second objective was looking at sacral neuromodulation specifically for nocturia in terms of uh, overactive bladder symptoms. Um, and uh, as I, uh, as we talked about from the guidelines, it is established third line therapy for overactive bladder. Um, and our early results are suggesting a durable nocturia response for patients with detrusor overactivity. Um, for our third and fourth objectives, we talked about stress incontinence, and obviously there's quite a few differences in the um, UK uh, versus um, Canada and the US in terms of how um, stress incontinence is managed in females. And here in the UK, we're gaining quite a bit of um, experience with mesh removal, uh, which I think is um, really interesting. And we are working on developing mesh-specific patient reported outcome measures. Um, of course, long-term uh, complication follow-up is uh, needed. Uh, I thank you so much for your attention and for this talk at this early hour in the morning for you. Uh, and also thank you to my crew, my BUI team, all featured here in Vienna recently. So open it to questions.